Hi, good morning, everybody. Tony Sweet here. Uh, this presentation was initially aired December 16th live, but uh, it was not recorded. So uh, I'm going to do this again, and we'll be able to um, post this and the recording on the uh, uh, Singray website. Um, we will not have Miss Michelle Paley with us from Singray to moderate <clears throat> since she's not here. And um, no live questions since it's a recording. So, but if you have any questions after we're finished, you can please direct them to me uh, at Tony at TonySuite.com. And I will respond to them. If you have an image in mind, please reference the image somehow so I know what it is. And uh, if you have any questions, please address them to Tony at TonySuite.com. But please bear in mind that short questions get answered first. You know, we're all very busy these days. So let's, um, let's see if we can get going here. Here we go. And one more little thing, turn off. Okay, here we go. Um, this is the uh, last webinar uh, uh, of the year for Sing Ray, so it's going to be very loose. We'll talk about just pictures in general. I've got a random sampling of pictures, some I think that are pretty good, some were instructive, and we'll just talk through them and hopefully give you some tips to uh, refer to in your own work. And um, anyway, let's just take it easy and, and talk about pictures. So this is who I am, this is what I do. Sigma ambassador and 35 years goodness of photo education. And here we go. Uh, it's just an image analysis. Just, we'll discuss the various aspects of each image, visual impact, composition, money-making capability, you know, uh, right place at the right time, storytelling, about the image or what the image tells you in general. Infrared, my new favorite thing to do. Well, not actually new. Uh, and of course, Singray filters and a few pro tips and maybe some more, whatever more means. So uh, let's get going. This image here is shot in uh, Eagle Lake in Acadia National Park, one of my favorite places to go. And at dawn, you get this kind of very soft, very beautiful light there on occasion. So let's get going. Let's begin with uh, the great Dr. Bob Singh and me. Lucky to uh, know this great gentleman for uh, almost 25, 30 years, you know, and uh, we all miss him tremendously. And uh, there's my tribute. So there you are, Dr. Bob. All this is from Dr. Bob. These filters are his. He's a physicist, very kind, very generous, very smart, not a bad legacy. Okay, storytelling. This is my most profitable image in my life. It was shot in, now we're gonna lose our signal. So I'll keep having to come back to this. Sparks Lane, Great Smoky Mountains, 1988. That's last century, by the way. The power of mail order. This image pretty much um, kept me in business for about five years. I was just starting out and I was lucky to have this image picked up by a company called Coldwater Creek, a national mail order catalog. And uh, there, yeah, there's some, some serendipity here. I sent the image in, submitted it to them, uh, like we did back in the old days, for consideration. And it sat there for a year, you know, and then uh, they changed art directors. They changed art directors. And she had a new look at everything and chose this to be a, a framed print in the Coldwater Creek catalog. And I said, yeah, sure. Knew nothing about it, you know. And... Uh, Sort of getting checks for like thousands of dollars a month, thousands, one, two, three, up to six thousand a month. And I couldn't believe it, of course, but I um, saved the money, thankfully. Not a lot of it, I needed to run the business. But this got me going. This one image, this one image generated enough income for a number of years to allow me to begin my business without having a day job or being sidetracked by money woes. This uh, supported me, my travels, my rent, <laughs> things I wanted to buy, while I dedicated my entire attention toward the business. So I was very lucky to sell this image uh, at the time that I did, uh, and it generated a lot of income. So it was very helpful. Uh, and it's, it's a perennial favorite of mine for, for many reasons. So anyway, 
that got me going. And then the second most popular seller image of mine is, is this called Spring Portrait. Um, first light on Oak Lane in, in uh, Charleston, uh, Magnolia Plantation, uh, D800, 7200, uses the, uh, the soft ray filter from Singray. Because to me, this is a portrait. Most of what we do in nature, unless we're doing landscapes, if we're shooting small scenics, they're mostly treated like portraits using the same light that a, a, a portrait photographer would use. Side light, very soft, diffused. It's a portrait, you know? And we enhance that by adding the, um, the uh, soft ray filter. Now, I wanna mention here that whenever you use a filter, shoot a, 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 an image all natural first. When you use a filter, it's baked into the cake. You can, um, you can at times nullify the effect in processing, if you don't like it, it's a lot of work. So just shoot one straight so you have it and then add your filters after that. And this is a spring, a uh, particularly nice array of azalea and just a uh, beautiful, soft, warm light. Um, very lucky to be there. And again, Charleston in the spring. Uh, this is tough now because they stopped letting us in before sunrise, which is when this light occurs at the very first crack of light here, it just touches everything. It's very beautifully. But since no one lives on the property anymore, they can't let people on uh, early. So now you gotta come in when they open. So you lose this opportunity. So it may come back, things run in cycles. So right now you can't get in uh, before sunrise. Anyway, just uh, to let you know, The shot on the way to the shot. Years ago, I wrote an article for Shutterbug called The Shot on the Way to the Shot. I kept discovering that I would always find better scenes driving to where I was going than where I wound up. And after I made that mistake two or three times, I decided to stop on the way. If I saw a great shot, I stopped, I stopped and I shot it rather than assuming where I was going was better, which is always not, you know. And, uh, and we saw this, this door, this door in the workshop. Thankfully, so my entire group got to see this beautiful scene and we all photographed it. And what's important here compositionally is uh, we have three boats and we have a descending line here, which gives you a nice, beautiful pattern. That shape right there is gorgeous. Cloud pattern is beautiful. See these clouds echo or mirror this little land mass right here. All the same thing, all repeating. And uh, framing the boats in between these the islands here is, is critical. You don't want to merge the, the tops with the, uh, the, the trees here, with the, uh, of the islands. Horizon lines you can deal with, but you want these things as separate as possible. Very clean, very simple, but it was the shot on the way to where we were going. And I've learned throughout the, my career to, to when you see these scenes, you stop. You don't keep going. And... Oh yeah, in Iceland, uh, the northernmost city in Iceland, the mainland is, uh, is uh, on the main island is the Sigl Siglufjörður. I have a hard time saying that, Siglufjörður uh, in Iceland. And across from the town is an island. And we took a, a boat across the fjord to get there. Small little village over here somewhere. And I noticed these huge like large moving like you know pods of water it's very slow it, 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 you may have seen that very small pods of water just moving floating very slowly when you get get up to a deep water and i wanted these these reminded me of the uh, salt pods in the death valley you know and uh took the camera off put the strap on my neck held the camera down on top of the water right on top of the water and moved the um the uh, screen the flip out screen at 90 degrees. So I'm looking down at it and composing and uh, just taking shots. The sun laid, lays here for about an hour. <laughs> it just sits there, you know. Sun sits and sunrise lasts a long time the further north you go. But I wanted these large pods here. And I got, got that by putting the camera down real low, close to the water and just shooting uh, this scene, beautiful scene. 
and a sense of place. We taught, taught at Ellis Island for a number of years. Loved it there. They're cleaning it up a lot from here. When we first started going there, it, it wasn't touched at all or very little. Now it's all cleaned up. Still great, but uh, all cleaned up. Come back here again. Here we go. But photographing inside out, whenever you can, or whenever I walk into a building, I want to find a window to shoot out so I can add maybe one more element to uh, 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 create that sense of place. Without the statue, it's just, it's just, a, just a room on the water with the, with the door. With this, it changed the entire story. So add what you can through a window to create, to, uh, 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 to create or enhance your visual interest, you know. We have several windows, or we had several windows that you know, allowed us to put the, put the lady in there to give us that sense of place. This is the uh, doctor's office. Uh, on Ellis Island. I love photographing artists rendering the same scene that I'm photographing. It's just really a fun thing to do. You get, um, and her pose is like perfect, man. Got the arm, the, the shape is just gorgeous. Got the hat, perfect, reaching out, painting. And I'm looking at this and that, and I'm seeing what I'm getting and what she's getting, her interpretation. So it, it really adds to the story when you can do that, adds to the story when you can do that. I always photograph artists, you know, when they're painting what I'm photographing, always, always interesting. Let's uh, discuss pandemic photography. Have you ever scouted your neighborhood like you would for a workshop? I think most of you would say no. I said no for years, but, um, yeah, I found during the pandemic, I mean, normally where we live is a destination. We come back for a few weeks, go on the road again, come back, go on the road again. Well, I'm getting too old for that constant running back and forth, you know? So we're staying home a little bit now, but the pandemic taught me um, to really scout where you live. I'm doing it right now as we speak. I'm currently scouting the area. I'll be doing that later today and tomorrow, but um, go back, sorry. But this is the whole thing. You go to different locations and you go back there different times during the year and you take notes. Sun rises here, sun sets here. I want this location here. It, it, it changes throughout the year. So you go to the same spot several times and then um, you come back when the weather changes. You know, it's, you make it a, a viable workshop venue. We teach a lot around where we live right now. A lot of private sessions, that kind of thing. It's horse country. It's very photogenic. Anyway, this is one of the great tree lines uh, in Oregon Ridge. It's just gorgeous. It's a, a farm education center now, but the, it wasn't for a while. But they paved this. It wasn't paved for a while, but they paved it, but it's all right. But the cemetery is just gorgeous. This tree will grow up and equal that tree, you know. But uh, beautiful. And also shot in infrared. Perfect IR scene. And a few, and just a few from where we live here. It's Northern Maryland again. Local pond, right time, right place. This scene, when this tree existed, this tree is gone now. But this scene was November, December. It's right around Thanksgiving right here. The sun comes up right behind that tree and will front light or backlight all the fog or mist coming off the pond. There's a similar scene in Yosemite uh, that I see a lot. Um, same situation. You have the, the fireball, Thinking of it like from the fire to you in layers. There's a fireball, there's the tree, there's the pond, and the photographer. So all these things, when the sun strikes through that, it comes through the tree and then lights up the fog that's coming off the pond. You get this beautiful backlighting, like explosion of light. And, um, and things change. Things change. That tree's gone now. I went back and I scouted, and uh, it's gone. It was around here, but they took it down and maybe added, I think they added this one to it. So now what do I photograph? Uh, the sun is over here. There's nothing over here. It's a different scene completely. When they cut that tree down, it changed dramatically. So I kept going back when I was in the area and I found these guys. Really nice. That's a good three, uh, three tree line. This is a good three tree line, etc. cetera. Um, but you need the right conditions. 
and we got them here. We got our fog, got a new composition, which is fantastic up here. And at this time of year, which appears to be uh, July, August, something like that, maybe spring, whenever these are leafed out, maybe summer, you know. But the sun comes up and it arcs right over top of there. It's unbelievable. Now, as this tree gets taller, this won't work. But on this day, it was right there. It's perfect. And I've shot this several times, different conditions. Like that's a beautiful scene. Again, it, it's a function of going back and just scouting and rescouting your area when you can. Dead ends. Never take dead end for an answer. You know, for years, I'd be like, oh, your dead end can't go there. So I finally took this one and it came out. This is the end of the dead end. From this point forth, it's all private property. But it's a dead end because that's where, private, that, that's where the road ends, the public road ends, and then private property begins here. Just a ridiculously gorgeous, rhythmic, long fence, just gorgeous, beautiful, great in infrared, midsummer again. Trees are full, you know. And uh, yeah, and where does it go? It's an historic house that's unregistered. It's on no registry, you know. Privately owned. There's a family back there, which is beautiful, you know. So it, it does pay. You can always turn around and leave. But check out your dead end. You don't know where it's going to dead end, you know. <laughs> and like here, just a wonderful hidden scene that I would never have seen if I didn't take that dead end road. So I learned a lesson from that. Take all dead ends. Local barn. This is two miles from where I live, off the side of the road, down a side road, I'm sorry. And uh, didn't know it existed because we travel, we come home, we enjoy our home, we stay here, <laughs> run errands, do stuff in the office, then leave again for the road. But during the pandemic, we were able to actually take time to scout where we live and found a lot of stuff. There's more stuff all the time. Just amazing. And I also learned during my scout here that there's no uh, 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 sunrise hits the barn directly on a very low angle. So the very first light hits that barn. And I'm thinking, what if it's foggy? Let me go back. And then we go back when it's foggy. And then you get the beautiful, one of my favorite situations where the, the sunlight filters through the fog. You get this like warm, just magical glow you know, around your subject. That's what we have here. So I know now that when it's ground fog, the blue sky, you get a hard sunrise, I go to this part of where I live, this whole street, get that beautiful floodlight, you know. And again, just by scouting where you live. A uh, new word today. I just learned this from uh, Mr. John Putnam, photographer up in uh, Maine, Acadia's Maine photographer. New word, marcescent. What is that? It's trees that keep their leaves all year. We've all seen them, these brown leaves, a bunch of sticks and some brown leaf trees. They're marcescent trees. The process is called marcescence. Learned a new word. What's important here on this shot is separation. You'll see that in most of my work, I like things very visually literate, very separated, nothing merging, nothing getting all bunched up. I like things as separated as possible. The first thing I look for when finding compositions is framing. How do I put something inside of something? And we do it here. We have a frame, trees in that enclosed in the frame. We got a frame down here and the tree is enclosed in the frame completely. That's what you want. You don't want things sticking out everywhere. Shot in uh, Acadia National Park. I love this. There are several kinds, go back. There are several kinds of, of light. Sorry, go over here again. This is framed by natural light. And, and, and yeah, I like this situation because um, 
the sun is on a low, a very low angle. And it just touches, the, it just touches this, but it's not strong enough to get beyond here. So the background goes dark. I look for that. I love this kind of uh, look, but it's natural. you got to get it with the natural sun only touching the foreground, letting the background go dark. Of course, as the sun gets higher, it lights up the back and then we have a whole other shot. But I look for this situation. I like skim light. Same thing in, uh, in Iceland, a town called uh, uh, Arnastapi, one of my favorite towns on the Snuffles Nest Peninsula. Sorry, it's hard to say in Iceland. <clears throat> Pardon me. Getting there well there. Try this attack here. Uh, okay, frame by the light. Same idea. Uh, the sun's going up at at the horizon. No clouds. It's at the horizon and just comes in as a real low skim light, which just touches the front of the coast and the keeper's house, but hasn't gotten high enough to touch the background volcano, which remains dark. Which I love that kind of thing. So it's framed by the angle of the light, the way it just touches certain things. And there were quite a few more birds, gulls. I cloned them out because they looked like light streaks and kept the ones that looked like birds. And just serendipity in general, uh, one of my favorite things to do in, in, in the most dramatic seasonal change uh, is, is from fall to winter because you're likely um, at the right time, right place, right altitude, to, uh, sorry, to um, get some snow with peak fall color. It's one of the, uh, you win the lottery, you, you win the photo lottery when you get this kind of situation. Uh, it's beautiful because the color remains in the, uh, the deciduous trees, but not in the non-deciduous trees. So the snow hangs longer on these trees as it falls off the, uh, deciduous trees here, giving you that great contrast. And of course, you sing ray polarizer to darken the, uh, take the glare pretty much off the, uh, the leaves here. Make the color pop a little more. Okay, hold on. Here we go. God darn it. There it is. Okay, still mixing seasons. We're in the Great Smokies. And, you know, again, the um, little bit of fall, you, you don't need a lot of snow. If you have fall color, a little snow will really stand out against it, you know. And we use the uh, Singray six stop more slow filter to slow the water, give the water a flow. And then again, it captures the, the mixture of the, the fall color and the, uh, the uh, winter light snowfall dusting on the uh, tree there. And again, one more. I just love this when it happens. Yeah, you, you can't shoot enough when the situation happens, you know. Uh, the shot was this, but then I found a way to include some color from the mountainside up here. The sun is striking up here, not down here. So the eyeball kind of follows the line, then goes right up into your color. Just leads you right up in there. Tell you the story. Seasonal transitions are to me where all the action is in, in, in seasonal photography, you know, because this, this tells a story. This shot alone tells a story. It tells a story of uh, it's, very, it's very quiet, crisp ground fog, red leaves, you know, it's the end of the, um, end of the season, you know, and it's calm, it's quiet, it's kind of warm, but we know, this is what I call a harbinger. We know that in a week or two, leaves will be gone, fog will be gone it'll be colder so snow's coming so it's kind of a harbinger of, of, of winter seasonal transition and again using the uh, sigma ray polarizer to uh, take, remove the glare from the red leaves make them look more colorful with no glare just solid red and notice the uh, trees limbs are going out of the entire frame on three sides Red Bank, colorful fall in New Hampshire. Same thing with, with the, your reds here. Notice they're like just flat red. There's no hot spots, nothing. They're all polarized out. They are glare. Hot spots are glare on these leaves. And we just polarize it out. And uh, I've got that deep red, beautiful red. Now, normally, 
I don't use polarizers that often anymore, but uh, you can deal with the blue sky thing in software, no problem. But I find that with uh, glare on leaves, it's still an essential filter. Polarizer used here, um, as you can see, in, in uh, outside of Bar Harbor in Maine, Blueberry Barrens, you know, again, look for, there's no white specks at all, no white specks that's glare. They're all gone from here. And another benefit is that it also, in this case, since the sun's off to the, uh, the uh, left side at a right angle, it will darken the sky a little bit. And when it does that, it, it, it pushes the warm clouds out. The warm tonality gets pushed out. In general, with visual design, cool colors recede here the blue, and then warm colors advance, which gives you the highest contrast that's kind of nice, you know, because it, it pushes, it gives you a, a three-dimensional feel. The clouds look more separated because they're pushed forward and the cool colors recede. So it's got this sense of depth to it. Really nice. Image swipe, got a couple of these here. Uh, that's just basically just moving the camera during the exposure. About one or two seconds, click, move the camera for one or two seconds and you're pretty much good to go. One second in this case. It was bright. So in order to get one second, I needed a sing ray very ND. And I was able to, to try different shutter speeds by turning the, turn, turning the uh, filter darker or lighter. I could get different shutter speeds to experiment with. What I wanted here was some detail in the color, not just a swoosh kind of a look, but I wanted detail in the leaves, which, which we have. You can see it. But I still wanted the birch to be those white, white swipes, like lines, you know. So we had to find a middle ground where it was long enough to, the exposure was long enough to get the, the smoothness in the clouds, but not too long to remove the uh, detail from the leaves there. Another swipe, people will normally either swipe horizontal, vertical, you know, uh, depending on the orientation of their subject. Uh, in this case, it will be a vertical swipe, um, but you can do whatever you can think of. Do whatever you can imagine. Okay, we needed a one second exposure to be able to, to do this move. It's not straight up or straight down, it's a swipe. It's this kind of move, you see it here. It's this kind of a hook right there. And I needed about a second to achieve that. So again, I dropped in a very ND. And I kept experimenting with exposures, over it, making it lighter or darker, you know, until I got the one second, which, which, was, which was seen to work here you know, little swipes right in here, right in here. That's the move. So whatever move you can think of, try it. Nobody gets hurt. You've got to experiment with this stuff. I used to hate white skies and now I use them. I have a white sky here, the pure white sky. And I wanted to add a texture the texture had color, so I desaturated the texture just to put texture in the white sky, just a little bit of texture, like a, 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 a plaster or something in here, just like painting. And you have uh, the white sky with detail from the texture and everything else is fine. Really fun shot in the Palouse. My favorite barn actually. I tend to look for scenes that are slightly surreal by their nature and then go to infrared to kind of push them over the top a little bit, you know? That's what this is. You have like a, um, you have basically a, um, not even a pier, just a block of wood that's hanging out over the ocean, you know? It's a really flat fishing pier or just, just a hangout pier. But in general, these people are standing there for about uh, a minute and they're not walk, 
walking around. They're just kind of like, you know, shifting as one minute goes by. But it makes them look a little ghostly. See it here. Their garments rendered white in infrared, which is great. They weren't white in real life. They were red. And the exposure is very long, about a minute. Gives you a very smooth ocean. I, don't, I didn't want to get too long in the exposure because I might the people could get the, you know, too blurry. So I thought one minute after watching them stand still for a while, I think one was enough to get just a little bit of movement. And the clouds weren't moving hardly at all. But we did smooth the water out with the one minute exposure. So it takes that surreal raw material and kind of pushes it over the top with infrared. And with this one, same basic thing here. Uh, this has, it, yeah, I love this shot. I'm not sure why, but I do. It's got a mystery to it. You know, there's definitely a, 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 a for, you know, foreboding sky. Something going on out there. She's watching something going on, but you can't see her face. It reminded me of a Norman Bates in Psycho, the original Psycho, where he, he's dressed as a woman, but he's a man. You can't tell what, the, what kind of person this is. You see the back of her head like looking at this uh, impending doom kind of a sky. It does tell a story, which is more uh, 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 interesting in infrared. And serendipity, just play the cards you're dealt. And situational awareness, what does that mean? That means when you're photographing something for a period of time, don't have your eye glued to the finder. Take a few shots, look around, look up, look behind you, look down, look to the left, right. Things are always happening, you know, so be aware of what's going on where you're not looking. So always look around all the time. What we saw happening was this, uh, this cloud formation, and it was forming. And we're up on this, uh, this walkway shooting in, in, into the, uh, the Charleston Harbor. And uh, this is happening. It's early, no traffic, which is great. But um, once I saw this form, I yelled, come on, man, let's get this shot. You know, this, come over here. It's great. You know, so we're blocking the entire street with photographers at tripods. You know, it's crazy. But this did not last that long. These clouds, as you can see, were moving pretty quickly. And we just uh, moved into the street over here, maybe in this whole area here, and just fi found our shot to frame that palm tree in this circle while it was there it didn't last long maybe a minute the clouds were gone but being aware of what's happening will allow you to capture these fleeting scenes better passing storms and in, in, in infrared they're fantastic the the what i like about them a lot and infrared in general is that the infrared properties there are two properties that are specific to infrared Number one, you get more detail in the highlights. Look over here. Look at all that detail. It's all in here. It's amazing. Incredible detail. And it makes the highlights glow all by themselves. It's the nature of infrared. So these whites, they glow. You see it here. It's an example. They just glow. Two great properties of infrared that I'm quite a fan of, actually. And movement. I like this shot because I took it for one reason and then liked it for a different reason. <laughs> I took this shot for the lily pads. And what a great subject, you know. Nice to compose, cutting things off properly. It's a nice, nice composition. But the more I looked at it, I kept looking under the water. I found more interest here, under the water, than on top. So the uh, subject changed from the pads to the underwater stems, where all the mystery is, all through here, especially here. In my, our favorite place, the Badlands, one of them, South Dakota Badlands. There are Badlands everywhere, but this is the South Dakota Badlands. These clouds are called Cumulus Virga. Uh, they're rain clouds. You see a, 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 a very arid, very dry areas, like, like the Badlands. Another dry area is, is uh, Death Valley. 
New Mexico, things like that. You have rain clouds coming in, but it, 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 it's too dry to rain. So they begin the rain and then they just stop. It just dries up on the way down and, and you're left with funnels. Just tremendous phenomenon to, to witness. Just tremendous. Very lucky to be there. And so we'll work with the Sing Ray uh, More Slow series. It's the 15 stop. I've got four minutes of exposure, 15 stop More Slow, which gives us that ex exploding clouds, the cloud lines coming at you, you know. You can watch the clouds and see how they're moving, moving to the right, to the left, away from you, in towards you. When they move in toward you is when you get this look. So pretty exciting when you see that happen. This is the blade, my favorite formation in the Badlands, South Dakota. Not a very long, uh, the clouds aren't moving that much. But when you're into like, you know, four minutes of exposure or longer, any clouds will move if you give them enough time. So I know they're moving very slowly. So I dialed in four minutes. I did 15 stops of ND. <clears throat> Excuse me. And got the, um, you see, what that does, when you have a sky that's smooth like that, with long exposure, it, it really pushes the sharp part of the image out. It creates this great sense of depth. You can see it here between the subject and the background. The same with the long exposure of water, which we'll see, I think, later. Again, this is uh, IR, infrared. And color. I went back. I tend to revisit. Not everywhere, but some scenes uh, over and over again when I go there. Because we're photographing light, right? I mean, primarily. So even at the same scene, the light's always different. The scene's just nice. The subject's just nice to have in it. But these are all pictures of light that just happen to be with really great subjects. And this, again, is four minutes. A little more cloud movement, as you can see here. Very little here. A whole lot here. So it changes. It changes, you know. Sorry about the little glitch here. Gotta go back. Okay. And we're gonna go. Mountain Rapids, Smoky Mountains, one of my favorite spots is the Moon Rocks area. Out around Cosby. And uh, this again is a minute. You see, where it's not really, really like a piece of slate here. There's some detail, but it, it's smooth enough. You see where it smooths at here. It's enough to get the point across. And shot in the winter, we do a lot of winter IR in the Smokies because a lot of the Smokies has uh, rhododendron. And rhododendron leaves are green all year long. All year long. Until the uh, flowers come out in July. The leaves remain on the uh, rhododendrons. And look around. Make sure you see what's available to you. If you find a pothole, try to find a way to use it. It's called potholes. If I see water in a little, like an area like this, I try to find a way to get something in it to create more interest. Infrared in the rain. This is my favorite time to shoot infrared. I know it sounds crazy. Why is that? Infrared in the rain makes the whites whiter, and rocks or metal or wood that's wet gets dark, almost black in this case. Creates a great contrast. Whites are pure white and anything wet gets dark. Like rocks, trees, metal, etc. Tree bark. Infrared in the rain. Turf Church in Iceland. The um, the uh, a design game here was to, as you can see, uh, this tree comes over here and frames the turf church. Now, mentally, I'm hoping you connect this to that because they're not. This tree branch comes way out here and the mountain goes way over here. They're not even close. But by creating the, 
the illusion of connection, I believe that your imagination, <clears throat> pardon me, will connect these for me. And you will follow that visually through here, right to here. The broken leading line, but if you, the motion, the momentum is there to draw you around this way. Winter reflections. You still get reflections in the winter. There's no leaves, but the trees have color. And when the sun strikes those trees into a shaded body of water, a shaded body of water in deep shade, pick up that color from up here and put it in the pothole. The several minutes, what is it, two minutes with the 15 stop again? No detail, water is very smooth. And then we're over here where it's springtime. Radically different. Everything's greener. Spring and a little faster, yes, your spring facelift, right? This is called split tree because of these trees. I'm sorry, software. This tree here, these split trees, it's why it's called that's why we call it split tree. Faster exposure, also rather than minutes, just eight seconds. Use a very ND to try different exposures, different shutter speeds because I wanted more detail in here. If you go back one, see, there's no detail. It's just all very, very smooth, very beautiful. Next one, I wanted more action with the running water, a little more detail in here. Again, with the uh, very endy. Pemaquid Point, Maine, sunset. I, I just love uh, this, this part. You walk out on the rocks, just love this place. But something else I like to do is to when the sky turns, when the clouds turn like that at, at dawn or at dusk, that is when I do a longer exposure. 16 stops here. So all that, all the colorful clouds like just paint across the sky as they move. You get a very beautiful, beautiful feeling. But again, the soft sky and soft water creates a separation. It makes the sharp <laughs> parts of the image stand out. They just stand out. And I addressed each of these pools down here. I selected them. A uh, little darker exposure, a little more magenta, little sharper, more contrast, et cetera, just to make these stand out. These three tidal pools down here. And some reflection on the ocean. The ocean is not still most of the time, it's always moving. And when the sun, you see it here on most, that, that's where it's striking, but it's behind a cloud, so a very thin cloud, so it isn't a very hot sunrise, um, so it's diffused, but it's hitting the water here, but for four minutes, the water's moving around. It's the ocean, and it's spreading that color out as it moves throughout the exposure, and you get this very surreal picture of color and just uh, beauty with the... Um, and I should fix that hole right there with these uh, old pilings in Cape May. Uses a, a 16 stop more slow. The difference between a 15 stop and a 16 stop is double. For example, whenever you go up a stop, exposure time doubles. So if I'm at um, say four minutes at 16 stops, it would be two minutes at 15 stops. It just half and doubles like anything else. Fifty ninth Street Pier. She is gone now. She was taken from us by Hurricane Sandy or Superstorm Sandy. Sorry, but we had about ten years with her. Very famous landmark that's now gone. But uh, I shot this one. I remember this vividly. Walking over the the beach, doomed to see this. Um, you could almost touch these clouds. They're almost touching the top here. Maybe like a hundred feet off the ground. Very low rolling like washboard type clouds you know it's okay but what makes the shot is this the reflection here that i really processed to make it really stand out and notice there's no detail in the pilings very high key <coughs> pardon me <coughs> very high key uh image where the uh, the whites are white and the blacks are just black all silhouettes I made sure there's no detail in these pilings. Get like a very simple high key with black. 
just black and white, no detail in the blacks. 13 stop, more slow. And we have smooth river fall reflections where the river is running about 10 yards past where I'm shooting. So this is near the, the shore where the water is more still. And we can do a longer exposure and get the water very smooth, get the color to smooth out. And these rocks just really stand out. And the other way is if, the, if there's cascading water over rocks and we get this, this gnarly kind of movement through these these submerged rocks here is beautiful. I have enough color, the gold, the blue. Here, the gold, the blue separation of color. Just a very long exposure, four minutes here. We'll get that that gnarly kind of rolling over the rocks. Very different feeling from that. Very interesting. And just don't clip the edge. You can come close but don't clip it. Long exposure use of negative space. Long exposure and the use of negative space, yeah. We talked about this. With the sky not being sharp, the clouds are moving, the water's not sharp, it's like, it's like slate, very smooth. So you have nowhere to look. The eye needs somewhere sharp to rest. And we have a little bit right here. That could be half that size and your eye will still go there. So anything sharp in the image. So you sense a negative space, calming, smooth water, very subtly moving clouds and a razor sharp tree, center bottom, not dead centers here, center bottom is where the tree is. And um, I like negative space, but again, making those things smooth and detailless makes you, your eye rivet to the subject here, goes right to it. And I'm trying to move on here. There we go. The sinking tripod. Who has not had that happen to him? <laughs> uh, set, setting up on the beach, wave comes in, tripod sinks. But rather than my normal freaking out and grabbing it and running, and like running away from the water, I stayed in there and let the tripod sink. And it was subtle. It was like very subtle movement, but I, I just made sure it didn't fall over. But I let it sink rather than grabbing it and running back to the beach. I let it sink and then we get this very beautiful movement, very soft, it's just water, sand, and sky. A little movement can't hurt. It makes it better, more subtle. You know, it's gorgeous. And now I do it on purpose. Take the tripod in the water on the sand with, with uh, no uh, plates to stabilize the legs. Let the legs drop a little bit and get this very beautiful uh, abstract look here. I love kids. I've got one. I was a kid once myself. They're just great. Just playing games, only they know the rules of, you know, and just free and just, uh, boy, I miss those days. <laughs> anyway, just, uh, you, you can't do this in the States too much because everybody's watching the parents and the, you know, the, child stuff it's just so terrible but when we're in cuba or foreign country they don't really care you know we're tourists with cameras we're gonna be gone in a day or two you know so they just don't care we can stand around photograph these kids playing their games and running around i don't know what game this is but they run back and forth in the wall to a person and it's, you know, again it's just some game that they made the rules and only they know the rules of that game and it's just fun to watch the main point here was to get separation to at least see the face of every child We see the face of every child. It's over here. <laughs> but I want a separation. They were running back and forth like crazy. So I took a lot of shots. And I think only two of them, two or three had the kids all separated. But I like this. That reflection, the natural re reflection, the shadow there is just fantastic. It's all leading toward that subject right there. Kids playing. Yeah, serendipity. I was taking a shot of the cars, the cars. The kid came out, looked at me. I waved, took one shot. He ran back in, ran back in. <laughs> Couldn't walk, he had to run back in. 
I'm lucky I got this shot. Came out, took one shot, ran away. A couple of friends of mine's um, um, kids, they're both in their 30s now. So the shot was a while ago after a band rehearsal. And if you notice at the very bottom, this, this, is, this is where knowing your lay of the land is important. <laughs> well, in this shot, I know on this driveway that there's a, a small hill right here small little upgrade or downgrade walking the way the kids are walking and i saw them walking away as i was packing up my drum kit I always have my camera with me in those days always my camera bag in the car and i see this i see this and it's like oh man this won't be around too long because as you see now they're walking over the top see if he's walking over that edge right there i had seconds tripod at ground level 300 millimeter lens at four uh, wide open, two shots, and they were over the edge. Just give give to them to them as a print. You couldn't believe it after all these years. Yeah, I love watching horses run around. It is so much fun to photograph and then just watch, you know. And I like watching them just to see how they run, how they mirror each other. And then I see these guys. I mean, look at this. Every leg is almost identical, even the overlap, <laughs> even the planted leg right here, even the one right next to it, and the tails almost. It's incredible uh, imprinting, I guess it is, because when they changed order, it was the exact same thing. You know, it's just uh, nature's amazing. Okay, with animals in parks, situational awareness is critical. When you get the look, you back off. You know, animals here, they're used to tourists, they're used to people, they don't freak out. But if you get too close, like here, I've wanted the sun behind this buffalo. So I'm like mirroring this guy, walking like, you know, you know a, little, a little bit in front of him to the left, and I want to get the sun behind him. So he, he stopped and looked me in the eyeball. I said, okay, but I got the shot by then. But that's when you go away. When they stop and they look at you, you leave. If you do it, they'll start stamping their foot and then they'll come after you. So um, got to be careful. Even in national parks, they're still wild animals, and, uh, but they're tolerant, but uh, they're still animals. You got to be careful and give them the respect they deserve. It's where they live. Trinidad color palette in Cuba. One of my favorite color shots from Cuba, actually. One of them. It's just all here. But what I wanted to do was to, to interfere as much color as I could. So I moved to the right and back. So this red part moved up into the blue area. And this stayed back in the burgundy area. And then the green reflected in the mirror. And then the cream color intersected the green so it's just all mixed up everything's touching everything i try to get as much color as i can in a color photograph and i kind of i uh, think i did that here and probably one of my favorite shots from cuba again trinidad color palette the painter now we're saying here to trust your instincts follow your instincts trust your instincts we uh, were there during the 500th anniversary of uh, Trinidad, and um, I'm walking around pretty mad because they're painting over all the patina here. <laughs> this is all going away. We love shooting this stuff, but it's all freshly painted. I said, oh, man, what a drag. So I'm walking around kind of moping around thinking, oh, man, you know. So I walked past this guy, but he's down here doing something with his paintbrush. And I kind of walked past, you know, thinking, okay, with a group. And then something hit me like, uh, man, you should go back to that. You should go back to that. Follow your instincts. You should go back to that. Went back 100 feet. By that time, he just stood up. And I'm thinking, man, it's pretty good. And then he reached up, started painting. And I'm like shooting, man, like, holy crap. You know, this is like perfect, you know. And then uh, one or two paint strokes, and he was somewhere else, you know. So uh, very lucky to get this. I'm lucky I went back. But this is uh, one of my favorite shots uh, from Cuba. Got the color, yellow hat, yellow wall, red just stands out, purple, blue. 
paint cans are all separated. You have three over here, one over here. It's just, it's just perfect. Balance edge to edge, balance here to here. It's just all there. I'm, I'm, I'm thankful I went back. And the Singray 690 infrared on a Nikon D800 color camera. Oh, well, you know what? That's a mistake. It says here, the D810. This is my IR camera. This is my color camera, or was my color camera. So the IR filter on a color camera, the way it works is that there's a hot mirror that always leaks infrared light. The hot mirror is supposed to block infrared to give you a nice clean color shot. But uh, as in most things uh, in life, it's not perfect. So it leaks infrared a little bit. We need a long enough exposure to gather enough infrared leakage to make an image. That's the game. So your exposures are a bit longer. So for one second, if that were a color camera without the filter, it could be maybe like a, a 30th of a second. But putting the filter on gives you a long, it necessitates a longer exposure. So we have this, the Singray 690 infrared. It is true black and white infrared. It's a little bit longer exposure. You can raise the ISO if you want to, to mitigate that. But you'll do some quality, it's up to you. But getting the shot's better than not getting it. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then another one here. But this is the way that I like using it. I've got an infrared camera converted. If I'm traveling and I've got to travel very light at some point, you know, um, during the trip, I'll bring the infrared filter and use that, bring that as an infrared camera, basically. Pop that on my color camera. I've got both of them. I got one camera, one filter. I got both things there, the infrared and the color camera with the filter. But again, you lose, you lose your, uh, 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 you need a longer exposure time. But when I need that, I carry the color camera and the filter and shoot IR and it comes out like true infrared. But I like using it like this. One color shot on a tripod, put the filter on, second shot, true infrared. Now imagine you have two layers in Photoshop. One's color, background layer, and then the one above it is infrared. You can do whatever you want, you can brush in, part of it, mask part of it, or just change the opacity 50-50. Have half color, half infrared. Let's go back. So color, infrared, and then 50% opacity. Get half of each. That's how I like to use that primarily. And some basic shots from Iceland. This is a Harana Fossa. The water comes from, look at the water on this thing. Oh, come on, come on, go back, Jesus. The water on this is coming from where? An underground spring pushes it through the lava. It's lava, actually. And then it comes out here with the glacial, glacial color. It's beautiful. That's fall, which is all this here. It's fantastic. Go to Foss means Falls of the Gods. Incredible. This is, a, this is my book cover on my, uh, on, on my latest ebook. I forget what it's called offhand. <laughs> but uh, it's on my website. And again, 15 stop, get four minutes. In order to separate the clouds, I just use my paintbrush to, to brush in some darkness here, very low opacity to create separation. That's it. People think that you need a long exposure for, for the northern lights, the auroras, but you don't. If you want to get any kind of detail, which is what this stuff is, this is your detail here. If you want to maintain your detail, I find that um, six seconds, eight seconds, four seconds sometimes, maybe 30 seconds, it depends, but I would definitely not stay on your longer exposures all the time. So you want to bracket. You want a... The widest lens you have at 2.8 or the widest aperture, I will start at six seconds and a high ISO, 3,200, 6,400, up around there. And 
monks gallery, I call this, because they're all in a gallery. All these monks look, <laughs> all these monks are watching God knows what, but they're watching something going on. I love the, uh, the flesh tone color of the underside of the clouds here. This to me was like, just blew my mind how beautiful that was. It's very like, like flesh toned. Never seen that before. Palouse Harvest. We love the harvest for this look. Uh, everything's been harvested. It's all done. It's all like fields now. But they're different colors. Different crops are different colors. Garbanzo lines are like dark. You know, the fields are dark. You know, wheat, soybean, just different colors, you know. And you see that. It's like the uh, skeleton of the uh, Palouse when it's all harvested. You see the underside of everything. Just gorgeous. Just gorgeous. We prefer it this time of year, actually, to teach, uh, to teach there. And a composite. Like the IR again, but you know, I like replacing fake skies and infrared when it works. It doesn't always work. It works in that case where I dropped in a infrared tree from Geneva, New York, and then a dusk sky from South Dakota. Just brought the sky in. Very easy to do now with Luminar and with Photoshop. Just bring in a fake sky, drop it in, and do some cleanup work. But in general, that's it's easy to do. Another example. I love doing this. In the Badlands, because it's so weird in the Badlands, to drop it in a weird sky seems to, seems to work, you know, because it's so surreal in the first place. Dust sky from I-80, and the foreground is called uh, Spires Valley in the Badlands of South Dakota. Sunrise frame, look at this, look how beautiful that is. This is, uh, this is gone now, These, this tree is gone. All those trees are gone from Botany Bay in Charleston. There's uh, still some there, but the ones that are out in the water are pretty much gone. Um, it's the nature of it. These trees cannot live in salt water, you know. So uh, they'll stand as long as they can have any kind of root structure, but as they kind of, uh, they, they soften as the, wind, as the waves loosen the trees, it'll start moving now during a long exposure because they're barely in there. And one big storm, and they just go down. That's what happened here. Look how lyrical that is. Not quite touching the fireball. I think that hole, very lucky to get that. But uh, it's not quite touching. It's just um, uh, reaching for the sun here. Milky Way Plus. Yeah, we're probably from the Milky Way in the Badlands. Uh, but it's right by the road, you know. So what we get here, I was expecting this because you always get some car coming down the road that lights up that hillside which i expected and it took someone the car was coming and did that what i did not expect was the car next to me of uh, the fellow shooting next to me has brake lights on for a while that's what that is so when i saw that i hit the exposure because i wanted to get everything i wanted to get that red in there and that's what we got very lucky, very unique, interesting shot. Just the right place, the right time. And the Epic Sky Memorial. Infrared in the rain. Infrared in the rain. Look how it glows. Look at the glow on that thing, man. Look at that. It's unbelievable. Just amazing. This is on the Liberty Park um, next to uh, Ellis Island. Pretty close. And last of the steamers, Cog Railway in New Hampshire. This has a feeling for me. When I even shot that, I thought this looks like the Industrial Revolution back in the 1890s, you know. Um, back then, they had like five steamers at the Cog Railway in New Hampshire. And at the end of the day, it looked like you went back 100 years. All the steam kicking up, you know, just, just remarkable, remarkable scene. And then my friend Joe, one of the engineers of the, uh, one of the steamers, who's still there, by the way, uh, and his friend got off and the engineer took this train down to, to put it away. Um, and they're talking. And I'm set up thinking I might get a shot. I don't know. And then uh, they separate. 
And then Joe's friend walks this way and Joe walks toward me. Five, six, bang, 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 two or three shots. This guy walks off the track and one more step he's gone. Joe cuts out right here, go to the parking lot and it was done. So I was so lucky to be there and to have them react the way they did and just uh, right place, the right time and a little bit of luck. And Lee Overlook, great Smokies. Uh, I love when this, this happens more than you would think. Again, with the very end, D, I wanted a little longer exposure to get the fog moving, like moving water. The fog is moving, flowing across the scene, flowing. And I wanted a little longer exposure to record that movement down in here, to feather it out. And that's all that is. Seeing my very end, D, to get two seconds, to get some movement. And, um, what we have. Hey, and that's me. Okay, guys, uh, thank you very much. Again, if you have any questions, uh, please email me, email me directly at Tony at TonySuite.com. And um, thank you so much for uh, your indulgence. <laughs>